Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I'm Demetrius Katsikopoulos. I'm the founder of Selectus, and I'm going to be leading the webinar today. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, just wanted to get started by talking a little bit about what our agenda is going to be. And there are a few things that I really want to cover off on today, and hopefully um, you'll come away with an understanding of. The first thing is just talking a little bit about what is a data lake? How do we um, how do we define a data lake and why you might want to use one? Uh, the next is really talking about what are some of the practical challenges of implementing a data lake? It's really not straightforward. Um, you can't just sort of jump into it without any planning. Um, what are some of the key challenges? What are the things that we've seen people run into as they've tried to get go down the path of having a data lake and how they handle them? And then finally, um, we want to talk through how do you get started with a pilot? And um, pilots do a couple of things. One is there, it's a way to sort of dip your toe in the water and start to get comfortable. Um, the other thing that they do is they help you mitigate some of those challenges uh, that, that we'll be talking about. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a demonstration of the, of the Magpie platform. That's the platform that Selectus makes. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some time for a little bit of Q&A as well. Okay. So a couple of quick process notes. Um, if you have a question, just hit the Q&A button that you'll see in the Zoom uh, button bar, and uh, you should be able to enter your question that way. Um, you know, throughout the discussion, uh, one of the, one of my teammates here is going to be looking at the questions and and throwing those up on the whiteboard. Um, and uh, if we don't get to them sort of as they're being asked, we'll we'll get to them at the end. And then uh, finally, if you run into any technical issues, uh, just enter it into the chat or or even uh, into the Q and A, um, and you know, kind of raise your hand and, and let us know. Um, I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, and keep going. Okay, so what is a data lake and why might someone want a data lake? There are a couple of dynamics that we've observed as we work with customers that we think are really important, and they're driving the need for a more agile, more responsive way to manage data for analytics um, in contrast to, you know, sort of static reporting databases or data warehouses that people might have used in the past. So the first one is that the analytics themselves are getting more demanding. Um, it's not just AI and machine learning, which, which clearly play a role and are becoming more prevalent in the industry, um, but it's also the fact that business executives and business leadership are becoming more demanding in their use of data. Um, we're now living in a world where we have a generation of, of C-level executives, CEOs, and, and their, their sort of immediate reports who have spent their entire career working with spreadsheets and dealing with data on a day-to-day -day basis. So the dynamics of, of their sort of needs are a little bit different than, let's say, 20 years ago when I got my start and folks were, were just not very accustomed to, to swimming in the data in the way that these people are. We need to be prepared for that as the people that are responsible for delivering that insight. Um, the other piece is the data environment itself is getting more complex. So data volumes are getting bigger. Um, we're getting, uh, you know, more and more data coming from devices, coming from uh, system logs, um, and coming from just behavioral data that we're harvesting from the web. The kind of data that's coming in is getting more diverse. And then finally, um, you know, people want up-to-date analytics on a continuous basis. That all suggests this data lake architecture, which really provides that shared hub at the center of the enterprise for delivering that insight. And what that means is ingesting that data, preparing it, and delivering it to the people who need it when they need it. From a practical perspective, um, you know, data lake is kind of this mushy concept that exists in the industry um, that hasn't always been well defined. Um, we like to think about it as three really key components. The first one is there's an underlying storage layer that lives kind of at the at the bottom of the stack, and that's things like HDFS in the past, and now increasingly things like blob storage in uh, in Azure or AWS S3. Um, you have things like relational databases playing there as well as other kinds of data stores. Um, but, you know, all those things taken together are sort of the storage layer for the lake. On top of that, you have a compute layer that's really independent of the storage layer. And that's really the difference between previous iterations of analytics infrastructure and this current generation. It used to be that your storage was pretty tightly coupled to your data warehouse cluster or, or computer. Um, and that's kind of, and those things had to kind of scale up and down together. Now your compute is independent of your storage, which means you can handle a lot more different kinds of workloads and 
you can sort of scale your storage independent of your compute. And that really changes the game a little bit in terms of the economics of designing a data lake. And then finally, from a management perspective, you really need a management layer that sits on top of all of this and kind of orchestrates it. And that includes things like running and building pipelines, but it also includes just having a catalog and index into your data so that you can find the objects that people have created and, that some, that, and so that everyone on your team is really working from the same page in terms of how they're accessing and, uh, and seeing data. And, and I would say keep those three layers in mind as we walk through this, because what you'll see is when people are challenged by these, by these uh, projects, they're missing one of these layers, typically the management layer, or they just haven't thought it through fully. Okay, so why might you need a data lake? There are a couple of different reasons for that. Um, a few of the examples that we see out there today, and these apply to a lot of different companies. First is you just have to integrate data from a lot of different sources. So if you're, if you're a, uh, you know, some kind of a retailer and you've got both brick and mortar and an e-commerce channel, you wanna allow those to work together seamlessly and you wanna be able to analyze their performance together. You wanna to understand how you're interacting with customers across each of the different touch points that you have. You might just have a lot of source systems that are siloed or you might be looking to integrate a lot of third-party data. From a, from a sort of data volume perspective, things like IoT, behavioral data, system logs, those are all creating a lot, more, um, a lot more bulk than we used to have, and we need just different ways of managing that. If you wanna put those all into disk storage, um, you're going to be spending a lot of money um, as opposed to using something that's like a little bit more near line and a little bit lower cost. Uh, the combination of different data types, structured and unstructured, is another reason to uh, to zero in on uh, to zero in on data lakes as a as a potential way of handling it. And then finally, doing things like training and tuning AI and ML models. Um, one of the questions that just came up, and I think it's good to take a pause here and answer it, is: Are products like Snowflake a data lake? Um, my my initial response to that would be that Snowflake is essentially a data warehousing analytics database along the lines of something like a Redshift or a Vertica that has adopted some of the best features of a data lake and allows you to operate in kind of a hybrid mode. So, um, you know, what Snowflake will get you is it'll get you the ability to sort of operate your storage independent of your compute. Um, you can, you know, spin up compute capacity when you need it. It's operating off of S3, which is a great deployment model, frankly. Um, but it's not as versatile as a, a true data lake because it's really oriented around um, you know, the kinds of dimensional queries that you're usually going to make against a data warehouse. So it's great at the sort of like slice and dice dimensional analytics that people think of traditionally when they think about data warehousing and OLAP, um, but it's not as versatile or flexible as a data lake, particularly when you start thinking about things that fall outside of that kind of computation. So things like training and tuning models might not be as amenable to Snowflake. Okay. Um, and then finally, from an application perspective, training and tuning AI models is another reason uh, you might want to use a data lake. And the, the, the key thing with data lakes is they have the versatility to let you kind of operate across these different modes. So, you know, why doesn't everyone have a data lake in that case? And the reason is it can be really daunting to build a data lake. And this is sort of just a picture of what are all the different kinds of technologies you might need to think about when you're building a data lake. Um, and, and it's a lot. It's a lot for any organization um, below a certain scale to absorb and understand. It's hard to make decisions across all of these different spaces and figure out what might be best for your organization. And it's challenging to, uh, and it's challenging to get all these things to work together once you have made those choices, right? And so, you know, from our, from our perspective, um, you know, where you're kind of asking a lot of an organization when you are, are driving them toward the data lake as a solution. And you've got to be thoughtful before you kind of, kind of get going. Um, you have to sort of, you have to develop at least that base level understanding. And that's really what a pilot can do for you. So this is a little bit of a preview of just what are some of the challenges with implementing a data lake. Um, a, f a few things that pop up immediately and we've kind of seen time and time again as we've worked with customers. First, you have this kind of ad hoc data organization that emerges. When people first started talking about data lakes, they almost thought about them as a big shared file system that maybe Hadoop 
or you know, later on Spark operated against. Um, that is useful to a point in that you get to leverage all this great scalable technology to do things like train models, but it doesn't scale from an organizational perspective and it doesn't scale from a sort of governance and security perspective. Um, if you're not organizing the data in an intentional way and keeping track of how it's organized, you're going to run into problems and you're going to end up with a big dumping ground where you have a lot of redundant data that's not necessarily secured correctly. The second thing is what I touched on just now, which is it's just a complex technology stack and asking any organization to kind of absorb and understand that is going to be a, a tough sell. Um, finally, you've got just scarce skills. So there aren't a lot of people out there that know how to do this. I think uh, some of you on the phone probably, probably do have that level of experience, um, but you know, getting comfortable with this technology and understanding it is something that a lot of organizations just don't have time to do. You can't hire a couple of full-time people to focus on this exclusively. So how do you get going without, you know, without breaking the bank? And then finally, just a disconnect from the business impact and not a real, and, and treating it maybe a little bit like a lab project or like a science project. Um, so another key thing to think about is how are you gonna actually connect this to the, um, connect this to, to value for the business. And that value can come in a couple of different ways uh, that I'll talk about. So for, for the ad hoc data organization piece, this is where that management layer comes into play. First and foremost, you really need to have a catalog. You need to have some automation around the data and you need to have a security layer that actually lets you control those objects that are sitting inside of your data lake. And when I get to the demo of our platform, you'll get a sense of what that means in concrete terms. But just broadly, you need to know where things are before they can be made useful to more than one person. With respect to the technology stack, there are kind of three options that you've got. You can get an end-to-end -end solution and, you know, uh, being, you know, full disclosure, we're one of the providers of, of an end-to-end -end solution that sort of solves a lot of those problems for you. Um, you can build the expertise internally if you think that that's a worthwhile use of time and that's something that makes sense for your organization. Or you can get external help from, from uh, consulting organizations, really. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that are willing to kind of help you go down this road. Um, either way, you're going to have to do one of those three things. You're either going to have to get someone inside of your organization up to speed. You're going to have to use some kind of a package solution or you're going to need to, need to get help from the outside. Um, for scarce skills, again, uh, you know, get that outside help, um, build those internal capabilities and really through training. Um, and again, longer time to value. You're sort of creating latency in your process by doing that. Um, and then finally, with the disconnect from the business impact, um, you've really got to make sure that the analysis is starting early. So you're not going through a six month exercise of implementing infrastructure and, hey, we're building our framework and our framework's going to be amazing. Um, you've really got to figure out how to get to data into people's hands as soon as possible, preferably within the first few weeks of an implementation. Um, and what you're probably getting from this is that all of these challenges are related. All of them, to some extent, are driven by how do you get to value as quickly as possible? And all of them are, are driven by taking sort of an organized approach or can be mitigated by taking an organized approach to building out the data lake. And doing a pilot ahead of time is, a, is one of the ways that you can, you can sort of achieve that. Okay, so why, why pilot? Um, you know, first and foremost, it really does help mitigate those biggest, the biggest risks. Um, you've really got to get your hands dirty early with the technology. And that might mean you personally, someone on your team, or one of your partners. But somebody's got to be sort of in there doing the kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat of, you know, getting your data into the data lake infrastructure that you've selected, figuring out what technologies work well for you and what, what don't. And, uh, and, and, and laying out a roadmap that's going to make sense and be feasible for you. Um, that gets the next step, which is you wanna be able to demonstrate feasibility and some value. You wanna show that, yeah, you know what, this works really in our context. Um, and that becomes a guide for the longer term value proposition when you move to a full implementation. Um, and then finally, understand what this means operationally for your organization. You're going to have all of these pipelines running. You're going to have to manage changes to this data lake. Um, a pilot can be a good way to understand what those warnings and red flags are. Um, and it's hard to understand how that's going to work inside of your team until you've had a little bit of experience trying to, trying to um, work with it. And, you know, and I'll, I'll lay out a little, bit of a, a little bit of a way to think about this. 
um, your data is different than anyone else's data. And you know, that one table that you have in your environment, that one large data set that you have in, in your environment can really change the sort of complexion of what operations looks like for you. It can go from being almost trivial to being extremely complicated and extremely hard. And you'll discover that during the course of a pilot. Um, and then finally, piloting is really, it really does play to the strengths of data lakes. So data lakes are hard to set up. It's challenging to get going. But at the same time, the flexibility of data lakes allows you to ingest data pretty quickly, get it organized pretty quickly once you get a little bit of a head of steam. Um, and you can do it in pieces. You don't need to have all of your pipeline building laid out. Maybe you script that part early on. Um, you don't need to have all of your security infrastructure completely ticked and tied before you get started. You can use the learnings from your pilot to inform those other pieces of the infrastructure. Because you're not getting a monolithic piece of technology, you can maybe get, get going a little bit faster. So what are some of the things you can do to make sure that you're succeeding? Um, two big pieces here, right? First is demonstrate some value. Um, and that can mean really one of two things, uh, deliver some kind of analytical insight. So, you know, figure out an analytical problem that your organization has. Maybe it's a new data set coming from a new product that they can't do reporting against yet. Um, maybe it is, uh, maybe it is uh, some business question that's been burning for a while, but it's just been challenging because of resources or infrastructure. Um, figure out what that is and kind of build your prototype data lake around that. Um, the other piece is complexity and, and cost reduction. Um, you know, if you've got an existing legacy environment and you can demonstrate that, hey, you know what, we're moving a bunch of this stuff into S3 and we're moving it out of the warehouse and suddenly our costs go down for maintaining our Redshift, in, our Redshift instance by $10,000 a month, that's a real demonstrable cost savings. And that's the kind of thing you can start to think about. Uh, once you get going with a pilot and you can sort of test those hypotheses around where the value might come from. Um, the other one is it lets you develop a really concrete handle on what's going on. So, you know, I alluded to this on the previous slide, but until you start trying to do the work, it's going to be really hard to anticipate what the challenges are going to be um, in your, uh, in your organization. Um, the one caveat here is you want to reflect reality, but you want to also be reasonable in terms of the time frame that you're setting for yourself. And you should be, Kind of time boxing this effort. Um, you know, you want to look at a subset of data. Maybe parts of it should be pretty big. Um, like you might want to take one or two of your biggest data sets and make sure that they're they're incorporated. Um, and and you might want to scope the the amount of technology that you're using. So you might not want to integrate every possible kind of source that you have. You might want to stick with one or two really interesting sources. Uh, to pull data from so that you're not dealing with like, hey, we're going to figure out streaming and we're going to figure out connectivity to this JDBC database and we're going to figure out how to get data out of this uh, API partner API. You might not want to do all of those at once. So what are the big steps in, uh, in piloting a data lake? This is the way that we like to think about it. First of all, define your objectives, figure out what you're trying to achieve. What are you trying to test? What do you think that the outcome is going to be? Um, how are you going to kind of measure it when you're done, right? Um, is it just checking the boxes on, yep, we've got the data in there, we're able to do analytics, we've got the security set up the way that we like it, um, and we feel pretty comfortable that we're going to be able to move forward? Great, that's, that's a set of objectives. Um, next is figure out your architecture at least minimally. Um, you know, what services do we want to use? Is it going to be on-prem or is it going to be in the cloud? Um, you know, given where we are today, it's probably going to be in the cloud for your first time out. Um, and, you know, what tools do we want to use? Do you want to just, you know, get all the open source stuff that, uh, and, and sort of, you know, work our way toward getting it pulled together? Or do we want to pick one of the vendors and work with them and, and hopefully get up and running a little bit faster? Um, maybe maybe uh, sacrificing a little bit of flexibility. Um, then really implement a static version of the data lake. And what I mean by that is don't necessarily worry about building repeatable pipelines up front. Just get your data into a form that it can be sort of used and interrogated inside of your data lake and you can, you know, point the Spark cluster at it or point whatever computation uh, you want to at it and, and just test, uh, you know, just, just test it, start getting a sense of like, hey, this is what, this is what our world will be like once we have this. Um, and that gets to step four, which is really perform analytics. Whatever that analytical goal you've defined for this 
initial POC is that sort of low hanging fruit, go ahead and do that and make sure that it's meeting your expectations and where it's not, understand why it's not. And then finally, then go ahead and start looking at pipelines for refreshing the data. And you might iterate a little bit uh, around you know, three, four, and five during the course of your pilot. And in fact, you probably will. Um, but this overall flow is, is usually the right flow with getting a static version of the lake built out as sort of a first step. Um, and then step six, you know, once you've kind of gotten through all of those hurdles, now what you really should be doing is reviewing what you've learned and then figuring out what your roadmap is. The point here is don't commit yourself to a big implementation until you've done kind of the fact finding that you need to do to be able to move forward. And this doesn't have to be, you know, six months of work. This might be, you know, depending on your organization and, and how you choose to move forward, it might be one or two months of work or three months, sort of a, a really quick turnaround project that matches the cadence that your organization is able to get it, go at uh, and drives out some real answers about how this is going to feel when you're, when you're really, uh, really doing it. Okay. So a little bit of, of tactical advice here. This is sort of the, this is sort of the, the real like rubber meets the road stuff. Um, first off, just evaluate your capabilities honestly. Um, be realistic about where you are as an organization and what you can do. Um, you know, if you don't have anyone on your team who's ever worked with the Java, you know, JVM, uh, you're going to struggle to set up a, a Spark, set up and configure and tune a Spark cluster successfully. Um, it's just going to be really, really hard. And you're going to not be learning about Spark. You're going to be learning about how to set heap size in Java. Um, um, understand what your bill of materials is from a technology perspective. Think about the full scope of technology that you're going to need, not now as you're starting out, but at your end point. You're going to need to have security. You're going to need to have some way of auditing people's activity inside of your platform. You're going to need some way of managing pipelines, and you're going to need a way to actually, you know, deploy new versions of those pipelines, track them, roll back if there are problems. All of the, all of that sort of operational infrastructure is something that you're gonna to need to think about. And you can choose to kind of pull that together and do, take a best of breed approach if you've got sort of the time and budget to do that. Or you're gonna to wanna to look at, you know, what are the pieces that I can pull off the shelf that are, that are already made that'll let me get there faster. Um, leverage outside capabilities, unless you've really got the luxury of time, work with folks, you know, like us, obviously not an unbiased pitch, um, to, to accelerate that delivery. And you'll see when I demonstrate our platform that that's something we're really, we're really you know, specialized around. Um, and then finally, get started. Uh, you know, the best way to learn is to really start getting your hands dirty. And, and I mean that sort of in a broad organizational sense, maybe not you in particular, um, depending on what your role is. But you know, get people touching this stuff and sort of understanding a little bit more about it so that it goes from being you know, this broad concept that I've laid out to something concrete. Oh, a data lake is a combination of these five technologies. And this is, you know, how the, this is sort of the vertical thread that, that connects those things. That, you know, kind of developing that, that gut feel is something that's going to really help you uh, move forward in a way that makes sense. So just to sort of summarize before I move on to the demo, basically the key things here are, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of useful applications for data lakes. And honestly, it's the way that analytics infrastructure is moving broadly within the enterprise, particularly once you get above a certain scale. So it's something that's gonna be on the radar, if not for you, for someone in your uh, technology team's leadership. Um, so you're gonna to have to start thinking about it. Um, that doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy. So you know, be aware of the challenges and really get yourself started uh, with a pilot so that you can understand what those challenges are gonna be and so that you can put together a roadmap that, that feels realistic. All right, so with that, I'm gonna jump into a bit of a demo that should take you know, 15, 20 minutes and then we'll have a few minutes left for Q&A. So I'm gonna talk about our Magpie platform and our platform is really an end-to-end -end, uh, end -end offering that allows companies to get up and running with their data lakes uh, quickly but still exposes you to the full power of, uh, of Apache Spark. Um, so, you know, I like to think of it as kind of the best of both worlds. You're getting this packaged approach and you're not necessarily forced to learn everything about, uh, 
about Spark or the underlying compute layer. Um, but, you, but if you are driven in that direction and you, you want to engage at that level, you absolutely can. Um, and so this demo is going to be focused on illustrating some of those concepts, particularly around organizing and cataloging the data and managing the, uh, managing the environment, um, as well as some of the government, governance components, um, things like audit logging and, uh, and security. So uh, a little bit more about Magpie. It's a cloud-based platform. It gives you all of those kinds of benefits. We've got that fine-grained object level security and really detailed activity tracking. So you have, you know, kind of the governance layer that you need. Um, we can integrate with a bunch of different kinds of data sources. And it's all of the things that you'd expect in a, matter, in a modern uh, analytics infrastructure, including things like streaming. Um, and we've got a strong focus on SQL as kind of the lingua franca for doing the work within the platform. And, uh, you know, the reason for that is it makes for an easier on-ramp for a bigger community of users at the start. That doesn't mean that you can't dive into Python and Scala to do really kind of heavy duty modeling or more complex data transformations. Um, it's just, you don't have to. And then finally, um, you know, we're fully, fully uh, kind of compatible with Spark. Um, not only is it our underlying compute engine, but all of our metadata, all of the metadata objects and catalog objects that we create are exposed to you inside of the Spark layer through a simple handle that we, that we provide. Okay, so for this demo, I'm gonna go through really a quick demonstration that is uh, about, um, really about site selection for a hotel. And so imagine that you're running a hotel and you are running a hotel chain and you want to pick a location for a new hotel. We're gonna combine some data from Airbnb to figure out, okay, where's their demand for rooms overnight? And, uh, and you know, what's the pricing like? We're gonna grab some data from the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Um, and we're going to combine those two to figure out, okay, where are there a lot of people because of the density of traffic of, uh, of uh, taxi stops. And then uh, we're going to combine it with some other data from the, from the uh, New York City uh, tax database to figure out what property values are. Then we're going to build a small pipeline to refresh some other data. And then, we're, then I'm going to just demonstrate a couple of quick things about uh, access control and activity tracking kind of audit logging that we have in the platform. Okay. Okay, what you're seeing here is our notebook interface. And um, this is very much like the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of notebooks that you're used to seeing, things like Jupyter or Zeppelin. And what we've done is we've taken it and kind of modified it to suit the needs of our customers and, uh, and, uh, and add some specific controls that, uh, that make it a little bit more easier to sort of navigate the metadata that we create. So, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to set up a data source. And what you can see here is I'm doing a create data source that's in our domain specific language um, that we use to manage all of the metadata inside of the platform. And we're just creating a data source, which is really a pointer to a Redshift instance. Okay, so I went ahead and did that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the schema information from inside of that Redshift data source. And I'm going to create objects inside of Magpie, create tables inside of Magpie that represent all of the tables inside of Redshift. That data still lives in Redshift, but now we can access it and query it from within Magpie. Um, next thing I, we do often as we kind of go through these processes is we'll go ahead and we'll actually profile a schema. And what schema profiling does is it lets us march through all of the data in that data source. And it tells us some key uh, statistics about it, like how many fields are there in each table? What's the row count? When were they last updated? Uh, when were they, when, what's the earliest timestamp in that data set? So we now know, you know, how fresh is the data, which are the big tables that we're really interested in, what are tables that are likely to be more like lookups, for example, these, these neighborhood tables. Um, and if you think about kind of, again, the, the sort of time to value from a data lake perspective, being able to understand your source data really quickly is one of the things that lets you kind of put your foot on the gas. And this is one of the ways that we've addressed it inside of our platform. And this is you know, kind of a, a magpie feature, not a general feature of data lakes. Um, now what I can do is I can just grab 100 rows from that, uh, from that data in, the, uh, in that uh, Airbnb database. And what it's doing right now is it's reaching back into uh, Redshift, which is uh, an analytics database that Amazon uh, puts out. And it's just grabbing 100 rows. And what you can see is these look very much like you'd expect Airbnb listings to look. 
So, you know, it looks like this data has been integrated the right way. We can see it inside of our platform. And now we're ready to start integrating it with other data. Now, where is that other data going to come from? It's actually going to come from an S3 bucket. And what you'll see here is we can kind of seamlessly combine this relational database data with data coming from S3. I'm going to create a new data source right now. And that is this uh, New York Taxi and Limousine Commission data, and it's sitting in an S3 bucket. Now, I'm going to create data from some files that exist in that S3 bucket. And those tables are you know, immediately accessible within the platform. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm saying, OK, grab this file and stand it up as a table. In this case, these are files that are all stored in Parquet. So they're you know, in, a, in a format that's, that's sort of easy to consume. Um, but we do the same thing with delimited file formats, with JSON, with things like ORC and Avro. So we have the ability to ingest files in a few different ways. Um, in this example, we're using Parquet, but you can imagine other types as well. Now what we've got is we've got these tables for yellow trip data, FHV data, which is for higher vehicles, taxi zones. This is a, basically a reference table of taxi zones and some aggregated data um, monthly. So the next thing we can do is we can profile tables. So I profiled a schema earlier on and captured some information out of that schema. Now I'm going to profile a table. And when we get this table profile, what we can see is we've gone one level deeper than just figuring out what the data types are. We've got these profile types that are telling us, yeah, this might be a number, but it's really a categorical variable. And this is uh, breaking down. There's this vendor ID that probably maps to some other business concept. Um, we know that this date this uh, pickup date time is a timestamp. Um, the neat thing there is because we know it's a timestamp, we still do this sort of top values thing. We still count distinct values. We still count null values. But what you can see is because it's a timestamp, we're going to lay it out on, on, a, on a sort of calendar based view. And we can see what is the frequency of taxi trips across the annual calendar. Um, you know, how did it change year over year? And we can start looking at things like well, you know, by day of week, huh, it looks like taxi traffic really peaks on Fridays and then peters out on Saturday and Sunday and sort of builds back up over the course of the week. From an hour of day perspective, we can see that as the morning gets going, you know, during the workday, uh, traffic starts to go up. And then in the evening, kind of right at the end of the workday, it, so it sort of peaks and then it peters off, uh, you know, through the evening. Um, you know, right now, we haven't really done any analysis other than typing in you know, profile yellow trip data. Um, another thing that we can do here, which is, which is also interesting, is we can look at trip distance. And trip distance in this case is a numerical variable. And because it's a numerical variable, what we can do is we can actually just lay out a histogram. And this all happens in an automated way. So we can see what's the distribution of trip distances across this, uh, across this um, New York City uh, taxi data set. And this looks like a pretty, sort of the kind of distribution you'd expect. Um, so it's neat. We can sort of sense check the data and figure out whether it's good without going through and running hundreds of, literally hundreds of queries ourselves to try to figure out what's in the data. Now, the neat thing is once we describe that tape, once we've captured that profile, we can describe the table and that profile is always there. The latest version is always visible. And that gets to the piece about having a catalog and having a way of finding the data and also allowing people to collaborate in the data. Now everyone has access to that profile and everyone is seeing the same view of that data. Now that we've kind of set our data up, we can run a couple of queries against it. And what I'm doing here is I'm just going to run a query that spans that taxi data and lets us look at, well, how does the sort of density of taxi drop-offs, uh, um, how does that correlate to the number of Airbnb listings and the price of those Airbnb listings? And so I'm going to go ahead and run this query. And what this query is doing now is it's actually federating across both Redshift and S3 and pulling the data back. We haven't actually moved any data yet. What we're doing here is we're actually analyzing the data in place, which is a great way to kind of, again, prototype rapidly, figure out what the data is, and then decide how you want to treat it over the long haul. And so what you can see here is we've mapped, um, essentially on the x-axis, we have the average price of Airbnb listings. And on the y-axis, we have the total number of drop-offs. And you can see a couple of things that are kind of interesting here. First of all, you're getting that kind of diagonal uh, up the up the chart, which means that it seems like places that are more dense from a drop off perspective are actually more expensive as well from a, a Airbnb listing perspective, which is kind of what we'd expect. 
Um, and then the size of the bubble is the total number of listings. And that's a little bit less correlated, but that's still sort of interesting. Um, and then uh, finally, we can do things like filter uh, our view based on you know, showing some or all of these different, uh, these different categories. So let's say that we've settled on a price point sort of in the mid 200s, and we're looking for a place that's relatively dense. We found this, uh, you know, 223. This is the Murray Hill neighborhood in New York. And knowing that, what we can do now is we can say, okay, great. We know we're interested in Murray Hill. Let's identify some target properties. And now what we're doing is we're creating a table from a URL. And this is again about integrating data rapidly and getting up and running rapidly um, while still creating an object that we can reference an, in a more permanent way. What we found here is that the uh, city of New York is giving us a 400 error when we try to access this and we don't control this data source. So this isn't, uh, isn't ideal. I'm gonna give it one more shot and kind of hope for the best here. Uh, but it looks like we might have to go with an older version of the data. Uh, this looks promising. Okay, this is what happens when you use a public data set uh, in a demo. So, so I'll just keep going and, and we'll see if that succeeds. But um, what I've done here is I've just basically described that tax records table um, from a previous load that we've done. And what you can see is it has kind of the things that you'd expect in it, including uh, including the, uh, the property value assessment. So what's that assessed total? And then what we can go ahead and, and do is we can run a query that lets us, uh, that lets us basically uh, bound it based on the block neighborhood and then, uh, and then get the, uh, and then uh, give it a, a sort of ceiling on assessed total. And what we find is that we've got about 37 properties that are below that $20 million property value threshold and have a lot area of more than 10,000 square feet. And so maybe that becomes our target. And it looks like uh, that create statement actually worked on the second try. So thank you, city of New York. And, uh, and I can go ahead and actually execute this query now. And we've got our 37 results. You just saw that run. And now I'm gonna save that as a table. And now what we've got is we've got a table with our target properties in it. And now we've got that target properties table, we can reference it later. And you can see how we've kind of like mashed together the data quickly. And that gives you a sense of how data lakes are useful. And you can see how some of the sort of value add tools that we have make it a little bit easier to, to do something like run in a, a pilot mode or get up and running at the beginning of a, of a process. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is create a recurring load. And um, we've got another data set that we're trying to pull here, which is a set of all of the building permit data in uh, New York City. And this actually takes about 10 minutes to download. So we don't wanna do that and sort of have to wait for it. So instead we're gonna create a job that runs it daily. And what you can see here is we're creating a job, we're adding a task where again, we're creating a table from a URL. And then, and then what we're doing is we're running a profile against that table. So we have, always have the most up-to-date profile information. We can execute that job interactively. And again, I'm not gonna execute it because what you can see here is that it takes about 10 minutes to run. Um, we can create schedules around it. And so here we're doing kind of a cron style uh, schedule. And uh, so this runs every day and we can have notifications associated with it. So when it fails, it, uh, it sends an email. And then finally, we can describe that job and it kind of captures all of that information in one place. So you can see, we're gonna run this, uh, we're gonna create this table and then we're gonna drop the old version of it and rename this, old, this new version to that name. We can look at the schedule and we can see this is set to run every day at 11 and that uh, John from our team here created it. And then we can look at the history of the job and you can see that it had failed. Uh, it looks like it failed on the fourth and it looks like probably because we did a deployment right in the middle of the run. And you can see for the past couple of days that it succeeded. So that's, that's how pipeline building works. And that's again about sort of sustainability. Once you know the data that you want, you can kind of keep it refreshed. Now I'm gonna just run really quickly uh, through the security piece of this. And um, what I'm gonna demonstrate first is just how do we create sort of secured areas in the data where, um, where people can work uh, and sort of we can limit access to, to others. Um, and then I'm gonna demonstrate how our audit logging works. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new schema. And let's imagine that we have an, an analytics team 
uh, within our company. And we want to give them access to read the data that we've just created, but we don't want them mucking around in it and maybe, uh, maybe changing it. So instead, we're going to create a schema that's sort of a sandbox for them. We're going to create a role for those folks called analysis team. And we're going to give them read on those, those, uh, those uh, two schemas that we were using earlier. And then we're going to give them create on the uh, analysis team schema. And then we're, we're granting access to, uh, to one user here. So what we can do now is we can go ahead and we can actually show that, yeah, you know, we've created this role. Inside of this role, we've got these permissions on these objects set, and here are the members of that role. Now that we have that, we can kind of see it in action by looking at our audit logs. So here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show an activity history for the entire organization. So this is showing everything that's happened in this organization. Went ahead and did that, and you can see a lot of what's been happening in this organization is the things that I've been doing during the course of this demo, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the one who's most actively using it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's the SQL query that I ran to uh, get that set of results um, at, the, at the block lot level for property, assessed property values. And you can see that it invoked the use and read permissions on the schema and then on the table. Um, you can see where my first create table from URL failed. Um, and you can see this more complex query. Um, it invokes a bunch of permissions on each of the tables that participate in that join, as well as each of the schemas that house those tables. So what you've got in this audit logging is a very detailed view of all of the people that have touched the data. So when you think about that kind of top level of management that I mentioned early on when we were talking about the structure of a data lake, this really captures all of those pieces in, uh, in one place and allows you to kind of get up and running quickly. Um, but you know, hopefully that's, that's really the end of the demo. Hopefully that reinforces uh, some of the concepts that we had uh, coming, out of the, uh, coming out of the presentation part of the discussion. Um, and with that, I'm gonna switch to the Q&A. We've got a couple of questions queued up. And obviously, uh, if there's anything you'd like to know as we continue to go through this, um, you know, please just post it up and we'll try to get to all the questions. Okay, um, so the first one is just cost and time. Uh, you know, what should I plan on, how long should this usually, this pilot effort usually take and how much should it cost? Um, you know, I'm gonna give uh, the kind of consultant's answer, which is it depends, um, but it really does. Um, I would say a couple of things. It should not take more than a quarter. Um, you shouldn't be, be at this for more than three months, sort of end to end. Um, and depending on your organization, it could take a lot less time than that, depending on, and, and depending on how you scope it. But you should be looking at something where, you know, within a period of, let's say, eight to 12 weeks, you've been able to turn something around. That gives you some real answers about how you might want to move forward. Um, and, and the big thing there is time box it. Um, you know, think about that. Think about the end of that pilot period as fixed. Even if you have to sort of flex the scope, try to get to a resolution that gives you enough information to start planning. From a cost perspective, um, I think that, you know, it really does depend on the volume of data that you have and the kind of help that you need. Um, if you're going to hire outside consultants to do this, it's going to be, you know, kind of hourly fees in the way that you'd expect. So you could be spending, um, you know, somewhere, you'll, you'll be spending probably somewhere in the tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars a month on consulting fees if you've got a couple of people engaged full time. Uh, if you're doing a platform, um, again, it really depends on the amount of capacity that you need, but you should plan on a few thousand dollars a month. Um, you can do this without really breaking the bank, depending on who you partner with. Um, but, you know, again, if you have a huge amount of data and you need to spin up a, you know, like a, a 50 node cluster, um, you know, suddenly your bill is going to go, is going to be, you know, into the six figures, right? So really depends. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, so those, those, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, that was one. Um, in terms of other questions up there, one is around just continuous integration and how do you kind of operate in a CI environment or how do you create CI in an analytics environment? Um, it turns out that that's really hard. Um, there are a couple of things to sort of think about as you think through what CI means or what continuous integration means or what managing deployment means in an environment like this. Um, you know, the goal should be to have almost a DevOps-like capability inside of your organization around data. Um, that's, that's a really high bar, but the idea is that there should be a lot of automation. You should be able to track what's deployed where. You should know what's happening inside of the environment 
Um, a few things that make that a little bit challenging is uh, database change management is actually really hard and there aren't a lot of great tools for it. Um, there are things out there like Flyway or Liquibase um, that help you with more conventional databases. I don't think there's really a great equivalent uh, in, the, in the sort of Hadoop space. Um, some of the vendor tools give you things that can help with that. Um, the other piece is thinking about how do you kind of revision control and what's the unit of configuration management for your uh, ETL scripts, essentially for your pipelines. Um, and the big challenge there is a lot of the tools produce these kind of opaque either JSON or XML files that you then need to manage. And that's not something that is incredibly useful. Uh, and so I would say be on the lookout for tools that let you, that have hooks into Git or that allow you to manage things really as scripts. Um, that's the thing that'll kind of get you, get you down the path. Um, you know, this is a really deep area and we could probably spend a whole other session talking about it. And in fact, we're probably publishing a white paper specifically about analytics ops um, sometime in the next week or two. Uh, but for now, I would say the big things are think about database structure change management and how you're going to handle that. Um, and, you know, you know, you're probably just going to need to be really organized around it and have a process. There's not a huge amount of tooling to help you and think about what are the things that you want to sort of control in the environment and how are you going to deploy those. And there it's, you know, think about things that are scriptable, things that you can get into revision control and things that you can sort of diff and merge like you would with code. Um, those are, those are kind of the high level steers. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, I think we're going to wrap up and, uh, thank you all for, for joining. Obviously, uh, if you want more information about Selectus, um, please feel free to hop on our website, uh, feel free to, to, you know, to email us and, uh, and we'll be glad to, uh, we'll be glad to, um, answer any questions that you have. Uh, I do have one question from the audience about how to, uh, pronounce my last name correctly. Uh, it is Katsikopoulos. Um, <laughs> I feel like someone's just ribbing me, um, but I appreciate it. A little bit, a little bit of levity um, at the end of the proceedings here. Um, again, thanks everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone joining, and uh, and we'll keep you posted on the next one.